Okay, so we're going to talk about new ways of thinking about fat transfer. Um, if you look at aging over a period of 20 years, you can see that with relatively standardized photography, if you will, maybe some more makeup than the before, uh, you can see that over 20 years it looks like there's brow ptosis, dermatocalasis, descent, but if you really measure those brow heights, they're about the same, and the right eyelids come down a little bit, but the left eyelids actually retract it up a little bit, so no real net gravitational impact that you're seeing over 20 years. It's principally volumetric loss. Uh, if you take a narrow time frame from early to late 30s, you can see that the, the early 30-year-old uh, face is already narrow. There's early signs of hollowness, but it really becomes much hollower over a period of five years. And so you got to think of the aging face it, like an, a glass of water emptying. Why use this model? Essentially, it's a way to communicate to patients. And I think it's very helpful. I'm going to talk about it more in a second. But if you think about fat loss, it really, if you ask most women when they thought they looked the best, if they're matured past 35, they oftentimes say around 32 because there's too much volume in 18 to 22. So if you say that, there's this emotional connection where the woman says, oh, I understand he doesn't want to put too much fat on my face and he gets me. And I, it's usually there's a smile that they understand that 30, 32 is actually uh, uh, typically a better volume state. And if you sort of take aging from one years old, 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, and you continue, you look at those photos and you just conceptually think about that aging process. It's volume loss uh, from one year old all the way to 80 minus you know, uh, weight gain that could occur. So people ask, you know, is fat grafting permanent? We're going to go more into detail about my philosophy w regarding that. And the answer, in short, is yes, but obviously you're going to age. So I look at this as filling yourself up to an ideal. And then with each, age that trans each year that transpires, you lose a little volume because that's the natural way of aging. You just lose some of your own natural fat, typically not the transplant of fat. So I'm going to sort of briefly go through this. You've heard a lot from Val and from Mark about understanding the blink concept and, and structural shape, how you can sort of recognize someone from 20 feet away and see that they look youthful or they don't, even before wrinkles set, even before you recognize wrinkles. Why is that the case? Well, it is overall shape. And there's this, this slow evolution of shape change from a full circle in, in childhood. As you get into the teenage years, there's still a full circle. And then when you get into the early 20s, that, er, that circle starts to change over to more of a uh, loss in the buckle area, but not very much by the mid to late 20s. It starts to dominate more by the late 20s. And then when you get into the early 30s is when you're starting to get that more, more sculpted appearance. And that sculpted appearance starts to give way to frank hollowness by the late 30s to early 40s, and then some more dominance in the lower face, so more of a squaring off effect. Um, and then as you start to hollow further in the face, again, with weight being static, you start to see the lower face start to dominate in your perspective. And then you can see truly orbital hollowness and much more attention to the lower part of the face or reverse the triangle. So initially what I thought about a good way to understand aging is reversing the triangle. But I think a more eloquent way that I've been starting to understand things is that oval is more of an ideal. And that's the, the, what Mark was uh, alluding to earlier, which is the concept of really getting the buckle area perfectly filled so that you can create a, a good transition from upper to lower face in terms of overall rejuvenation. So the concept is not making triangles, but making ovals. So this is an example of a lady that has a pretty large uh, malar bone. And you can see that with that shape, the goal is to actually fill the anterior cheek and the buccal area. And what that's going to do is going to soften that malar uh, prominence so there's more of an ovalization of the face and blending, uh, uh, blending effect. Over here, what you can see here is that she's got you know, a, a relatively full buckle. There's a little bit of hollowness, and it, you, it actually sits right underneath the cheekbone out here. You know, I divide the buccal area into three areas. The area subzygomatic, far laterally, or backfill area sort of the central buckle area. And then as, as we don't see this as often now, but as in, into the 60s or 70s, we start to have, if there's poor dentition, some medial buckle hollow where it starts to cave in medially. So I conceptualize the buckle area into those three areas. And this, to me, is a little bit of posterior buckle hollowness, but not significant amount. And by blending that down and then blending across the jawline, you get a, a, a very nice combination. She did have laser, and she also had uh, an upper blepharoplasty in combination. Uh, this is an example of, a, of an Asian face that has more of a, of a wider buccal area and a, and a wider lower outer face. And so to de-emphasize that, I filled more the central cheek, didn't do anything to buckle, buckle, did anterior chin work. And a way that I sort of explain this to patients to understand how balance work, and this is part of the aesthetic or artistic element of it, is that if you look at a glass of water on a television screen and I ask you how big is this glass of water, 
You'll say, I have no reference points, I can't answer that question. But if I put a shot glass next to it, you think the first one's big. If I put a pitcher of water next to it, the first one looks small. And so that concept of balance is how I look at a face and just try to see, just like when you do rhinoplasty, you want everything to be in harmony. Longevity. So I do a lot of hair restoration in my practice. And it really it was a model with which I started to understand longevity. So I was, as I was studying for the hair boards, I started to look at Unger's book and started to see why does hair take so much time to grow. And the reason for that is there's a process of neovascularization after primary uh, inosculation and secondary inosculation. And so I really see that fat transfers start to transform over a period of a year to two years. It's just a different model of looking at it. A lot of people uh, blame it on stem cells or what, why do they improve over a year. Some people think they gain weight over one or two years. I personally think there's something, a maturation process that occurs over one or two years through a, um, a long-term vascular, vascularization of the graft itself. So if you sort of follow this, I see initial swelling early on. I call this the dip over a period of three to six to nine months. There's variability in this. And then I usually tell my patients, don't panic with this because there's going to be, there should be overall a softening effect. And then you start to lose a little bit more. And it's never as, as swollen as your initial, you know, one month result either. So you got to be careful not to convince them that the one month result is a final where all the, you know, wrinkles are stretched out and, and they look almost perfect. And I think that's a misleading time as well. Um, this is a, just to sort of follow through, this is a, a one week f uh, photo of a 48 year old lady. And you can see over about a month, to me this looks pretty good. And then at three months, maybe it looks better with a little less swelling. Uh, and then over six months, you start to see her hollow a little bit out and you start to wonder, is that gonna dissipate? And then over about 11 months, you can start to see it fill in. And then over 15 months, you can see it fill in. The only other thing I did for her was Botox, no skin treatments, nothing else. Um, and this looks like the lighting is different. It's the same room with controlled lighting. And I don't use fill-in lights. I really challenge you to, if you're going to do volume work, if you do a lot of fill-in lights, you just can't see any of your, the changes. It gets washed out. And I think this is a more representational quality to how we see each other's faces in real life. We, we see each other's faces with top-down light, whether we're outdoors or indoors. So I try to simulate that and have you see the faces the way that you would see it normally, rather than a controlled studio setting with two washed out lights. Uh, just a matter of perspective. So another element of hair restoration is the concept of donor dominance, where hair harvested from the back is moved to the front and it behaves like the hair from the back of the head. I think that's the concept of understanding why fat is so weight sensitive. I always say the number one risk with uh, fat grafting is weight gain afterwards because where's the first place you gain weight when you, where's the first place you see it when you gain weight? It's, it's in, your, in, the, in the belly for men and the women will be thighs and belly and that's where you harvest from. That's why I think there's a tremendous durability with that. However, there's also the negative which is you got to be careful with uh, weight gain. And that's why I think people that are, you know, early 20s and mid 20s when you're using it for reconstructive purposes or being aggressive in your application, you have to be very careful. Um, I think that the older you get, the more, the safer it is, almost like hair restoration, because there's, there's better track work, record of understanding weight safety and understanding long-term outcomes. This is a, maybe recipient dominance is there, influences of the skin, to, uh, is a donor area influencing the skin, is a skin influence, is, is there back and forth plays or softening effect? I don't know. I mean, we'll talk a little bit at the end about some thoughts of what I have about stem cells, but I don't think it's entirely clear. Uh, and then, you know, there's, or is it just a fact that there's, uh, the, the graft has gotten better over time? And so people always say, what, what things could you do to make your fat graft take better? And I'll, I'm always very hesitant because I always say, you know, I don't want my fat to take better because it's going to be too full. I sort of know predictably where I put it, what I put in it at day one will give me what kind of result at, at year one. Um, it doesn't mean my results are perfect, but I, I don't want a result that's too perfect because if you overfill, it's even a worse situation. It's very hard to rectify that. I almost want to get them to about an 85% result. And I really believe that if you fill a lot of little areas of the face, overall you create such a good result that you don't have to worry about you know, one little area being perfect. That's when you come in with maybe a little filler and manage it because fillers are much more precise than fat. Fat provides the best foundation for the entire face when it's global. Um, when do you use implants versus fat? There's a lot of talk about using alloplast for aging the face. And I like the concept of light replaces like. I think it's an easy way to understand this. So if you think about fat loss as we talked about, that's really where we are today. We don't lose a lot of bone. We do lose bone, but in the era of good dentition, I think the bone loss is proportionally less than the amount of soft tissue we lose as we age. And so 
if that's the case, then I think we should look at replacing soft tissue. Why, is it, why should we do that? Well, if you look at aging, the soft tissue envelope starts to d disintegrate faster than the bone loss. And so your margin of exposure of bone is actually starts to become more obvious. So if you it put an alloplast in, you actually expose more bone and you actually increase transitions and increase bone exposure appearance. So that to me is maybe not the right answer for aging in the face. So obviously if you're doing a great job with alloplast, great. This is just a concept I like to um, talk about. So we go back to the aging model and if you understand fat transfer, it increases that distance. So I think that by covering exposed bone, you create more of a favorable uh, highlight to shadow ratio and, and, and also cover bone that you can't see. So you see how much bone is on the right versus soft tissue on the left. Uh, so again, implants, in my opinion, exacerbate shadows. Fat transfers uh, diminish those shadows. And if you think about our Fat, is fat transfer then the, the beautiful answer for everyone? And I believe that that's not the case. If you look back and, and see that um, what I was mentioning, a lot of the metabolic changes long term are real problematic, that implants in general may be safer in younger pe people with, with uh, more metabolic changes over their lifetime that you can remove the implant down the road and they have a better soft tissue envelope to cover it. Whereas you get older, minus weight uh, fluctuations, perhaps it's better to use fat grafting in people that really need soft tissue volume versus hard tissue uh, alloplast augmentation. So light replaces like is a concept that I think helps understand that. This is uh, a gentleman that had a chin implant and liposuction. I don't think he needs fat grafting in there. So this is just sort of a, a, a nice table to how I sort of articulate this to a patient is a fat transfer, someone older, how old? It's, that's a you know, relative term. Just like when I do hair restoration, I think the older you are, the safer you are. Uh, the implant, the younger you are, the safer you are in my opinion. Uh, you're welcome to disagree with that. And then I believe that like replaces like, as you see. And uh, really the, the major thing, as you heard from most of the speakers talking about fat, is that weight is a real critical issue when you're talking about long-term safety. Stem cells, just in conclusion, there's a lot of stuff going around uh, about this. I, I'm not hard convinced that the stem cells are making the changes in the face, as you heard my earlier hypothesis. But I think they are. It's very, very rich in stem cells and the adipocytes that are down in the, in the belly area. So I think that there's probably a concept that it probably is affecting something. I just don't know well enough to make a comment about it. The book we wrote, if there's any questions, my email. Um, and what we can do is, I, had, I do have a, a five minute video if there's not a lot of questions, but otherwise, I was just gonna show you know, the tear trough because everyone wants to know is that how to do that because that's the hardest area to do, but it's pretty simple if you start doing it. Uh, I, we can field questions before that. Any questions?